This is the last sermon in a series on the Lord's Prayer. And so I want to bring back into the conversation Gospel of Matthew 6, starting with verse 7, when Jesus says to those who have gathered, when you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. The notes say that other ancient authorities add in some form for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Amen. Pastor Sarah and I undertook this series as your pastors because we felt the need to focus on prayer. We desire to lead us all into a greater prayer life. Prayer is powerful. It's like drinking water. It has so many benefits seen and unseen. Its greatest benefit, like water, is one of its greatest benefits is like satisfying thirst, a relationship and communion with God. We want to increase your practice of prayer as a spiritual discipline and your appreciation for prayer as a follower of Christ. What better place to begin than with the prayer Jesus taught his original followers? What if we could come to understand what Jesus himself taught his firsthand followers, his closest friends, and the communities that gathered right in his face, those who would have been on Jesus' Zoom worship, looking at him just like this. What if we could come to an understanding of what he was trying to convey to them? What if we could come to an understanding of what Jesus himself taught his firsthand followers to pray? understanding the prominence of prayer in that culture. And Jesus is telling them what to pray. What if we could come to an understanding of what he was trying to get, to get across? Prayer, it seems to me, can be a window into the heart and mind and spirit of the prayer. And Jesus left us many words, but Jesus also left us this prayer. Jesus knew his followers would have to carry on without him, so he taught them this prayer. He knew his followers would face persecution in his name, so he taught them to pray this prayer. He knew his followers, as they followed his journey, would experience the journey of resisting a culture, not just a religion, but a societal culture that was dominant, that they will become the minority, if you will, in the majority culture. Many of the cultural norms which Jesus redefined, such as healing or doing anything on the Sabbath, eating with sinners, not stoning the woman caught in adultery, spending time with those on the margins of society, feeding them, healing them, helping them, letting them know their lives matter. Jesus knew some of his followers would continue in his footsteps, being countercultural and seeking to love thy neighbor as thyself while challenging the status quo. So Jesus taught them to pray this prayer in preparation for that work. Jesus taught this no frill prayer to his followers to cover just the basics needed for being a follower of a revolutionary who sought to bring about an ethic of love and a kingdom of God ruled by love, equity, peace, and justice while resisting a dominant culture of superiority versus 
inferiority, oppression, discrimination, rule king, and love lacking. So it is in this context that Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew's version, it's included in the Sermon on the Mount, a series of sermons that Jesus taught, Jesus preached, where he lays out his countercultural principles, spends some time in the Sermon on the Mount, and meditate on the sermons of Jesus. I promise you, I won't mind if you listen to that preacher's preaching or any preacher's preaching for that matter. Matthew 6, verse 7, in the midst of this sermon, speaking to the crowd that gathered, Jesus says, when you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then this no frills, only the basics, the most important things that I think as Jesus that you need to know as followers. Pray this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And that brings us to our last petition of the prayer. But before we move to the last petition of the prayer, let's take inventory of where we are with the first four petitions. This is, after all, a glimpse into the heart and mind of Jesus and what he wants for his disciples, his followers. You know. Jesus wants his disciples to have a close, intimate relationship. Pastor Sarah told us in the first sermon, like Abba Father, like a parent-child relationship with the Holy Creator. And so you pray it every Sunday. How's your relationship with God? How's your prayer life? Do you talk to God through the week? Do you commune with God, feel the presence of God, hear the responses of God? Do you feel a Abba relationship with God? Jesus wants God's kingdom to come and for the disciples to resist the current oppressive earthly kingdoms as they work to be God's kingdom. You pray it every Sunday. Do you see with fresh eyes the oppression of earthly authorities and principalities, the places that places people in class and caste systems and does not value all humanity as equal? You pray it every Sunday. Now do you see with fresh eyes and understand that your faith life calls you to resist earthly rulers and systems of oppression and division and to work for God's kingdom ruled by justice and love. Jesus wants God to feed his disciples daily. Give us this day our daily bread. You pray it every Sunday. Do you realize there's a hunger within you that physical food cannot fill? That only God can fill? Do you desire even yearn for God to fill you daily? Jesus wants God to forgive our wrongdoings while reminding us that we also have to forgive. You pray it every Sunday. Can you make forgiveness a spiritual practice? The holiday seasons are approaching and some of us are harboring unforgiveness for loved ones that we've carried for years. Yet we pray this prayer absolutely every Sunday. And if we miss it, we feel it. But can you make forgiveness more than words you say on Sunday, but a spiritual practice as you ask God to also forgive you? See, it's, it's like we can say that this prayer gives us this upward relationship with, between us and God but it also makes sure that we're mindful of the horizontal relationship between us and our fellow man and woman. 
So you can use the cross if for no other reason but to remind you that we are to be mindful of our relationship with God and our relationship with humans. Now we come to the last petition. And it's just as foundational as relationship and daily bread to the life of the disciple. Jesus closes the prayer with lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. On this journey called life, this journey called discipleship, this journey called Christianity, we will face and have faced temptation and evil. Jesus included in the prayer just for just as core to life as a follower, as the need to have a relationship with God and with man, and as core to the life as daily bread is the reality of evil. It's not surprising to me that Jesus included this in his deepest thoughts, that which is on his heart and mind towards his disciples at this time. His own encounter with temptation and evil are in Matthew 4, surely fresh on his mind during the Sermon on the Mount. And it must have impacted him so that he includes it in this short, memorable, no frills prayer for his followers to pray. And when we come to understand the centrality of temptation and evil to this journey, and even to what we are experiencing in our country today and in our world, we won't say this prayer by rote memory with no meaning, just as words from our lips with no feeling in our hearts, worried about the words someone else uses or doesn't use because we'll understand that we need to be praying, deliver us from evil, and when we say it, we'll understand we need to mean it. Temptation and evil are real, and they are, are about more than chocolate cake and your neighbor's good-looking spouse. They are about systems we encounter on a daily basis and whether they have been co-opted by evil when they could be for good, and whether we are unknowingly and willingly participants. Jesus experienced evil firsthand. The spirit made sure of it. His time of temptation was so personally challenging, apparently, that he includes in the petition to God that God lead his followers not where God led him. Matthew 4.1 says that Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And the temptation, the first one, listen to it. Verse 2 says, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. The temptation, prove you are superior and use your power to feed yourself. Prove you are the son of God. Prove you're superior and use your power to feed yourself. The second temptation, verse five, the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. The temptation, prove, again, prove you are superior and that God will save you on command despite your foolish actions. I'm going to repeat that. Prove you are superior and that God will save you on command despite your foolish actions. And now the third temptation. Verse 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and said to him, all these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. The temptation, pursue, go after this superior earthly power, glory and authority. It can be yours. 
superior earthly power, glory, and authority. It seems to me that the three temptations presented by evil are all really the same temptation, and that is the temptation to claim superiority and power. And Jesus told his followers in his no frills prayer to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver from evil. Jesus wants his followers to have nothing to do with these temptations. The temptation to want to be superior and have all power, he simply wants God to deliver us from the evil that tempts with such a temptation. What is it about evil that Jesus boldly asks God to deliver us from it? Well, evil is in the beginning. We find it first in Genesis 3.1. It reads, now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. Evil is crafty, it's subtle, and it entices you into the conversation. Let's, let's look at the first actual temptation. The serpent responds and says, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The temptation, you will be like God you will be superior. Here's one for your notes. God never intended for any humans to have a spirit or a mindset of superiority. Yet evil, according to the scriptures, puts this temptation in the front of humans at the beginning of time. And before Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, and Jesus teaches us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, because Jesus knows that evil tries to co-opt the will of God. God has a reason for Eve not to eat. Evil tries to thwart God's plan. God has plans for Jesus. Evil tries to thwart God's plans. God has plans for us. Evil tries to thwart God's plans. And if it's not God's plan that we have division and hatred, pain and suffering, lack and poverty, but it is that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we love our neighbor as ourselves. And who is our neighbor? Our neighbor is the one to which evil wants us to believe we are superior. If it's the homeless person on the street, if I think I'm superior, I will not even make eye contact and believe, just assume that he's there by his own fault. And what does it matter? If it's the young teenage mom, if I think I'm superior, I will believe she made her bed, let her lie in it. If it's the young black male with his pants hanging down, if I think I'm superior, I'll just write him off as a thug, miss an opportunity to mentor and show love and care and concern for the one who is the most endangered in society by no fault of his own. If it's the person of color in any setting, if I think I'm superior, I'll be quick to think they are less than, less intelligent. I'll be fearful and I'll use my power to block their progress or even to take their lives. Nothing good comes from a sense or belief of superiority and it can stop us from ministering to the least of these. Can stop us from fighting for justice and can cause us to just feed ourselves. 
So Jesus included this last petition to thwart evil's plans against God's plan for beloved community by praying, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So as followers of Christ, what then shall we do about these things? Open your eyes to evil. It's not a devil with a pitchfork. It's injustice, it's racism, it's capitalism that exploits and oppress, oppresses. It's disrespect for another's culture, another's language, another's humanity. It's mass incarceration that made us believe we should lock people up for offenses that often don't deserve punishment at all, like drug offenses and mental health challenges. It's Christianity that rejects people for not conforming to some man-made standard of holiness and righteousness, that rejects people for not looking like us, loving like us, or worshiping like us. Open your eyes to evil. The Apostle Paul says it's always present, especially when we're trying to do good. It's subtle and it's crafty, Genesis tells us. And when it's present, what are we to do? However evil shows up, we need to be anti-it, anti-racist. There's books that will teach you how to be an anti-racist. And there's a whole movement starting among your peers on the screen that will help us, Hyde Park Union Church, be anti-racist. If it's homophobia, be anti-homophobic and pro-love. Love, love, and let it be. When you see or hear division, no evil is present and be a catalyst for reconciliation. When you feel your own privilege rising up, remember the enemy wants you to embrace it, will tell you you deserve it, and encourage you to own it. But God wants you to trust that God can give you everything you need when you relinquish that privilege and walk humbly with God. There's nothing like knowing you can be fed by the hand of God. Nothing more exciting than knowing that God has affirmed you. Nothing more life-giving than knowing that God is mindful of you. Nothing more liberating than knowing that all you have needed, God's hand has provided. Nothing more freeing than trusting God with your life. The enemy tried and is still trying to thwart God's plan. He started in the garden, contended, continued in the wilderness. He tried to thwart God's plan, a plan where there is no superiority, but instead there's a plan of beloved community where there is truth and justice and harmony and love for all humanity and creation. But I remind you, my friends, as Dr. King reminded us, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Keep leaning into that arc and let us help it bend as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into the temptation of superiority, but deliver us from evil the evil that would cause us to divide ourselves from one another. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.